Welcome, everybody. My name is Alex Maws. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR. Uh, and on behalf of the AJR, I'm very uh, proud to be one of the, for our organization to be one of the co-sponsors along with insiders, outsiders of tonight's talk. Um, this is a topic that is uh, very significant in the history of the AJR, um, looking at uh, Bertha Bracey and the history of the Quakers who helped so many AJR members come to this country and get settled in the first place. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that we have with us tonight, Mike Levy, who I've known and worked with for many years and who is the person that I turn to anytime I have questions uh, about the kinder transport. Anyone who has had the chance to listen to the AJR's kinder transport podcast series will know that Mike was a, a regular contributor to that. And uh, also to welcome David Dobson, who I hadn't met before um, tonight, just a few minutes ago, and very, very eager to hear him speak as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with the AJR, we are a social welfare organization supporting refugees and survivors uh, from the Holocaust. And if you know, if you are or know of anyone who might benefit from our social welfare services, please do visit our website at ajr.org. UK. Um, we're, this is, uh, we, we realized last night, it's been a year that the AJR and Insiders Outsiders have been partnering on these online events. We're very pleased to be partnering with tonight's event. The significance being that it's in the, the lead up to Refugee Week next week. So what could be more timely than to hear this talk about uh, the role of Bertha Bracey and the Quakers in um, in helping the kinder transport uh, to, to happen. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome you all to tonight's event. Um, just a few very practical details. Uh, we are recording tonight's event. So if you either need to um, leave at some point or you know someone who isn't here tonight uh, and would benefit from it, it will be on both our YouTube channel and on the Insiders Outsiders channel um, in a week or so. Um, but that also means that if you're not uh, keen to be on a recording, the easiest thing to do is just switch off your camera so you won't be seen. Otherwise, please do leave your camera on. It's nice to see all the faces out there of the people who are listening. Um, we will have uh, time for questions and answers at the end of Mike and David's talks. Um, the best way to ask a question is to do it in the chat box um, and, and uh, direct it to Monica Bohmduchin, uh, who will be the person who will relay the questions to our speakers. Um, everyone is on mute as usual, and, um, and you won't be able to unmute yourself. So we've just done that to make sure that there's not too much uh, background noise during the presentation. So with that, welcome everybody. And I'm going to hand it over to Monica Bohmduchin from Insiders Outsiders. Lovely. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Yes, it's my very great pleasure to add my words of welcome to those of um, Alex representing the AGR as the Insiders Outsiders initiator and now the director, a festival that some of you will know was designed to pay tribute to the cultural contribution of refugees from Nazism. And this event, slightly unusually, I have to say, is not focusing specifically on the arts, but I'm also intensely aware and have been from the very beginning how the Quakers and the help they gave, the precious help they gave, features in nearly all, I mean, I would say that really quite sort of sincerely, nearly all the life stories of the various talented individuals that in the Insiders Outsiders project is now and continues to, to celebrate. So, and I've been wanting to do something about the Quakers for a very long time. And I feel bad that it's taken quite so long to make this happen, but we're in good hands as you will soon discover, both with Mike Levy. And I'm also delighted to say David Dobson as a representative of the Quakers who will be talking second. So if I could start by introducing Mike, first of all, many of you will, I think, have come across him. He's a Cambridge-based professional researcher, uh, educator, critic, playwright, and journalist. He holds a fellowship in Holocaust education from the Imperial War Museum and is a frequent educator for the Lessons from Auschwitz program run by the Holocaust Education Trust. Also in, in 2012, he was awarded the In Memoria Medal by the Polish government, no less, for his history play, The Invisible Army. He's also a researcher for the government's UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation and has 
uh, been engaged, I think, fairly recently by the AJR itself on a project to map the impact of the Holocaust in this country. I could go on, he's done many other things besides, but he's best known, I think, for his commitment to the memory of the kinder transport and its relevance to the present. So he's the chair of the Harwich Kinder Transport Memorial Appeal, which is trying to raise money to create a new sculpture in the port where most of the refugee children arrived. And he's currently writing a book, which I'm very much looking forward to reading myself, um, called provisionally, I'm not sure if it's the final title yet, but basically on the forgotten rescuers of the kinder transport to be published early next year in 2022. So over to you, Mike, with many thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Monica, for that very kind introduction. Uh, uh, well, let me just very quickly uh, give you a, a very brief overview of what um, I hope to do today. Um, I'm going to race through the enormously complex and wonderful life of uh, Bertha Bracey in all her various, well, some of her various guises in terms of the rescue of refugees. And if I've got time, but only if I've got time, um, I'm gonna say a bit more about some of the other lesser well-known uh, Quakers that worked with Bertha Bracey and for Bertha Bracey, in fact, as part of a, an enormous nationwide team of uh, Quaker rescuers. It really was a very remarkable story. So let's see if we can get onto our second slide. Yes, there we are. There's a, there's a rare photograph of, of Bertha Bracey, one of the uh, leading British Quakers involved in the rescue and humanitarian support of refugees, um, especially of course, those escaping Nazi, pers Nazi persecution. Um, she and her fellow Quakers on the, um, uh, well, Joan Hoare, I don't have a photograph, but I do have a photograph there of uh, Elizabeth Mary Pye and Dr. Hilda Clark. These are really, were very big figures in the rescue of um, children and adults for that matter from Germany from 33 onwards. Hilda Clark, by the way, there you can see in what looks like a, a sort of Red Cross uniform and sure enough, she was uh, um, very much involved with the Friends Ambulance Service during the First World War, and um, as indeed was uh, Edith Pye. Um, so more names, I mean, I mean, there will be a lot of names, but hopefully they'll, they'll start to come together and make, and make some sense. So let me move on to the next one. So um, in 1933, where of course our story often begins when you're looking at Holocaust studies with the rise of Hitler, Bertha became secretary of the Friends Germany Emergency Committee. Um, this was a post that she retained really right up to 1945. And within two years of its um, foundation, the Germany Emergency Committee, I think the, the name tells you what it did, under her leadership, um, they brought out at least 600 people out of Germany between 33 and 35. Many of them uh, in those early days of the rescue of, uh, of people were opponents of uh, Hitler, pacifists, socialists, communists, and of course, Jews. It helped that Bertha was a very fluent German speaker and she'd built very close contacts with Jewish welfare organizations, both in Berlin and Vienna. And uh, she coordinated the efforts really of the German Quakers to help identify those most at risk of Nazi persecution, thus assisting them to, to flee from Germany. By 1938, she actually led, uh, it's amazing this, she led a staff of 80 volunteers at the Friends House on Euston Road, which is, I'm sure some of you will know, it's still there. That was the headquarters of the Germany uh, Emergency Committee. Uh, but it, things got so big that they had to move to Bloomsbury House, of which I'll, I'll tell you a bit more later. Certainly, Bertha was a driving force behind the whole kinder transport program. So let me tell you a little bit about her early life. There you can see her as a younger woman. She was born in uh, a name that will mean quite a lot to many of you, Bourneville, near Birmingham, Bourneville of course, associated with the Quaker family Cadbury. And in fact, her parents were employees of the Cadbury family. She herself was not a Quaker, interestingly. 
uh, but she came became a Quaker after she attended Birmingham University. Uh, and um, we think around about the age of 19, she became a Quaker, possibly after reading Quaker literature from America, particularly. After a five year spell as a teacher in the early 20s, she went to live in Vienna, where she worked at the Quaker Centre and helped run youth clubs and support needy German children after the aftermath of the First World War. Then she moved to Germany, first to Nuremberg, not to do nothing, of course, but guess what, to help set up and run a depot where deprived families could buy food and clothes cheaply. And then she moved to Berlin and continued working with the children in the greatest need. She was actually part of, um, let's see, get my slide, bit. yeah. She was part of uh, the Quaker Speisung in Germany. This was a, an, an, um, a, German, a Quaker feeding program to help the starving children of Germany after the First World War. If you remember from your history, after the uh, Versailles uh, Agreement and Treaty, uh, Germany was put under such economic pressure that it filtered down to really to families, children in particular, not being able to afford enough food to eat. Um, and uh, a, a nationwide scheme of food dispensing, like food banks, if you like, was set up by the, by the Quakers, British Quakers and German Quakers and Americans uh, through the whole country. And uh, it was something, it was quite ironic in some way that the feeding program that Bertha was part of was kind of remembered by leading Nazi figures a decade later, who often said that we knew about Quakers, we, we the children remember being fed by the Quakers. And to some extent, uh, some of them said that they owed a debt of gratitude to the Quakers, that stood uh, Bertha in quite good stead a decade later when she had to negotiate uh, with the Nazis. So uh, Bracey's time in Germany enabled her really to observe through the 1920s the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party at first hand. And she has this marvellous quote that she, that she made in, in her book that she wrote in the 40s. And listen to what she had to say. If more people had read Mein Kampf, they would have seen that the very regulations of National Socialism contained its poison. And the deepest poison was, of course, its anti-Semitism. So she was a very early um, warning figure, spotting that what the Nazis were up to. So she returned to London in 1929 as the admin secretary of the Friends Services Council and the Quaker organizations. Her aim coming back to England was to develop a network of uh, Quaker centers, uh, which would be, as she called it, havens of peace and reconciliation. Her life in Germany, of course, as I said, helped her to make very valuable contacts with both German and Austrian Quakers, and also with the leaders of Jewish welfare organizations. And we'll talk about some of those in a moment. In fact, I'll talk about them now. One of the people that she got to know very well and counted as a very close friend was Wilfred Israel. She first met him in Nuremberg and got to know him very well in Berlin. Uh, Wilfred Israel was the head of the equivalent, if you like, of the German Harrods, the, the poshest department store in Germany and Israel and co. Uh, and because he was a he had a British passport, he was an Anglo-German, he was sort of given a little bit more leeway in terms of what he could do under the Nazi gaze. And this gave him some control over helping uh, to get the Jews out of, out of Germany. So uh, we have this kind of combination between uh, Bertha Bracey and Wilfred Israel um, in helping to organize the escape of, of Jews. Um, she comes back to England and she, she's, uh, she speaks at Quaker and other rallies, um, spreading the word. Here's a quote from her uh, from the early 30s, from 33, 30, 1933. Anti-Semitism is a terrible canker spreading poison for decades. 
Um, and Germany is dropping back into the cruelty of ghetto psychology. Words are not adequate to tell of the anguish of some of my German friends. And she writes that in April 1933, really very early on in the rise of Hitler. She's very quick to spot that her Jewish friends in Germany are under uh, severe pressure. As early as June 33, Bertha uh, set up a committee, uh, this German emergency committee in London, and she sent a circular letter to all the Quaker meeting houses around the UK, including um, that in Cambridge where I'm speaking from. It spoke of the shock of the British friends at the turn of events and the need to raise funds to provide aid to the victims of the Nazi regime. Um, and she also made a, a point that the, uh, this new kind of Nazi definition of non-Aryans, i.e. people who are pretty children, uh, who were not Jewish by faith and religion, but had Jewish ancestry enough for the Nazis to call them Jews, these non-Aryan refugees perhaps needed particular support because there was no one really there to, to look after them. She was also very concerned to um, get out of Germany though, those that she thought were in political danger, pacifists, uh, socialists, which she said have no hope for any future in Germany. Again, she writes this in 1933. So, um, there's no absolutely no no um, doubt in in Bertha's mind that the Jews and uh, opponents of Hitler are in mortal danger uh, by staying, and that something should be done uh, to help get them out. She uh, begins really from the early 30s. This Germany Emergency Committee setting up in uh, the Friends House in Euston Road starts to collate cases of. Uh, desperate people, desperate Jews and others in Germany wanting either for themselves to get out or to get their children out of out of danger. So by 1938, for instance, uh, she had collected 14,000 case files um, of people who had written to her desperately asking was there anything that she could do to help get them or all their children out, out of out of danger. She also used her influence and considerable powers of persuasion to help secure the release of Jews and others from those early concentration camps like Dachau and Sachsenhausen. Once she even received a direct response to a query about some men who disappeared from Reinhard Heinrich himself, then head of the Nazi intelligence branch. She was totally unafraid to write letters directly to Goering and even to Hitler himself, you know, asking, if not demanding, that the people that have been locked up without any cause uh, be released. Just going back a, a stage uh, to 1934, actually, in that year, um, remember Bertha is very much now in, based in London, but in that year, she helps to set up uh, a Jewish refugee school called the Stokely Ruff School. And she does so with an emigre uh, teacher, Hilda Lyon, who you can see there, a progressive boarding school for refugee children from Germany. And although Stokely Ruff was the brainchild of Hilda, Hilda Lyon, it was Bertha Bracey that she contacted to help find, get donations, to help find the building to help organize, you know, from scratch, a complete boarding school uh, for Jewish refugee children. So actually, although we're talking in a way about the kinder transport, uh, Bertha Bracey is involved in the rescue of children before the kinder transport. In 1934, the children start to arrive at the boarding school, allowed in under an educational visa, uh, and hence allowed to stay in Britain, for, at least for a time. Uh, she was governor of Stokely Roth School right up to 1960 uh, when she retired. And actually, so, so going back a stage after, after Kristallnacht on the, as you know, the November pogroms on the 20, on the um, 9th and 10th of November, 
38, uh, Bracey made contact with her old friend Wilfred Israel. Wilfred Israel had appealed to the Council for German Jury to save any Jewish children below the age of 18. So Bertha and her other Quakers, uh, a team of Quakers, immediately traveled, and this was like a day or two after Kristallnacht, to Germany to assess the situation on the ground and reported back uh, to, to England. And she says this, it was clearly not possible for a Jewish organization to undertake the task of investigating what's going on in Germany. And so at their request, the German Emergency Committee selected five persons to go to Berlin, make contact with one of the few Jewish men leaders not in prison, and she meant Wilfred Israel, and under the direction of this man, brackets Wilfred Israel, the investigators went to various regions. They spread out across Germany in every kind of major town and city to find out for themselves what the situation of the Jews were, was after Kristallnacht, and to report back to London. And of course, there is the uh, photograph of the, of the November pogrom, which brought all the, the, the tension um, and the situation of Jews to a head. In the first few days following these November pogroms, there was a, glowing, a growing clamor in the British press um, to speed up the visa process, particularly for uh, young German Jews. Um, and on the 21st of November 38, soon after Bertha came back from Berlin, she immediately formed a very high powered delegation to visit the Home Secretary at the Home Office. And they met the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hall. Here he is. And they brought back with them to Samuel Hall those first hand accounts from Germany. In fact, Ben Green, one of the Quakers, cousin to uh, Graham Green, the novelist, by the way, Ben Green, one of the Quakers, had, had just come back that very morning, that of the 21st of November, with a handwritten long report on the horrors that he'd seen uh, amongst the Jew Jewish populations of Germany. And with that very strong report and with Bertha's power of persuasion, they it could be said, it's slightly open to some debate, but it certainly could be said that swayed Sir Samuel Hall to essentially initiate the whole uh, kinder transport program, which was initiated after that meeting on the 21st of November, 38. Um, and the, the planning of that kinder transport program was certainly done um, with um, Wilfred Israel in Germany, with the Quakers and the Jewish Refugee Committees in, in London. And there you can see just a few days after that 21st of November meeting, the first arrival uh, of the uh, kinder transport children um, in England. They can see them waving from a ship coming to the harbour in Harwich just a few days uh, after that 21st of November meeting that uh, Bertha had arranged with the Home Secretary. So the, the, the speed of which things were happening were quite, quite remarkable. Um, in what I, what I can't show you, because we don't have any photographs of it, is between the November pogrom, Kristallnacht, and the arrival of the children, we've got this delegation of Quakers throughout Germany finding out what's happening. We've also got the German, the Quaker Center in Berlin, which I'll tell you about a little bit, a bit later liaising with the, Jew, the Jews of Germany to try and identify the children who would be able to come on the kinder transport. So the Quakers are taking an absolutely crucial central role in the identification of the children, in the arrangements, the transport arrangements, um, in the um, uh, lobbying of British government to allow the children into the country in the first place. They're absolutely at the centre. And in the centre of this storm, is this remarkable woman, uh, Bertha Bracey. There she is again. Apart from uh, child refugees, I know that my brief today is to talk about particularly kinder transport, but when you talk about this, this lady, you have to take a, the wider picture because although she did focus a lot on the children's uh, refugees, and we'll talk about what happens to them once they were here, 
She was also very concerned to get as many Jewish women out of uh, Germany as possible. And this was, a, as you may know, was allowable because if you could find a, a domestic uh, service, you know, if you could find some work for these women as domestic servants, maids, cooks, etc., then they would be given special visas to come. And she set up through the Germany Emergency Council uh, committees known as the Domestic Council for German Refugees under her chairmanship, of course, uh, to find well, first of all, to train uh, these Jewish women who have no experience probably of being a domestic servant and then finding places uh, for them to be employed. So quite a remarkable, uh, uh, quite a remarkable set of, um, of help. Um, here's a picture I think next of the uh, refugee uh, headquarters at uh, Bloomsbury House. The building is still there, I took that picture before lockdown, that became the sort of nerve center, if you like, of the whole kinder transport uh, rescue mission, not just the Quakers, but Jewish Refugee Committee, the Church of England committees and so on. But the Quakers took the third floor of the whole of Bloomsbury House. And uh, I've, uh, I've pointed my arrow at, at where I think possibly uh, Bertha Brace's committee and her Quakers would have been working up there on the third floor. And by all accounts, the third floor of Bloomsbury House was a haven of peace compared to the rest of the building, which was inundated from morning till night by Jewish uh, families, refugees, people seeking help, desperate to get their remaining families out, pleading with the uh, refugee committees to do something to help them. Um, Bertha up on the third floor with her 80 plus volunteers working all the hours that God sent uh, to try and process as many visas, as many kinder transport applications as she could. It's one of my little bugbears, by the way, that there is no plaque outside Bloomsbury House, given that it was the major refugee headquarters for the whole of the wartime period. Blue plaque people, take note. When, uh, when, the war, when war broke out, of course, the kinder transport children had arrived um, in England and no more were allowed. Of course, as we know, some of the children were stuck on trains on their way to Britain and not allowed to come because war had been declared. Bertha turned her attention to two major uh, elements in this story. Uh, first of all, the care and welfare of the children who were already here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but also very much pressing on her mind was from May 1940, the internment of uh, German Jews and others uh, classified as, of course, enemy aliens. And um, Bertha's uh, real interest for the for time being in 1940-41 uh, became the, um, the, the, the release of these unfortunate people, many of whom uh, uh, had to be locked up behind barbed wire in places like the Hutchinson internment camp on the Isle of Man, you know, in the company of real Nazis. Uh, and she knew that this was an appalling miscarriage of justice. And she worked closely with uh, sympathetic members of parliament and lobbyists uh, to work for the release of as many of these internees as she could. Many of them, as Monica knows only too well, many of them very distinguished artists who'd been locked up uh, uh, in, in these camps. And of course, Bracey becomes chairman, I don't know how she had time to do all these things, of the Central Department for Interned Refugees uh, with the, with the uh, MP Eleanor Rathbone of blessed memory. So um, as I'm just going back a stage, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm whizzing now towards the end of the war because at, at the end of the war, Brace's interest, once most people have been re uh, released from internment, uh, she, come, she turns her attention to the plight of the survivors of the concentration camps. And um, she later described the most significant of her interventions with the British government. And to quote her, she says, 
when the concentration camps were being opened at the end of the European war, um, I went with Leonard Montefiore, there he is, chairman of the committee for the care of children from the concentration camps to the war office and persuaded them to put at our disposal 10 large bomber planes, which with their bomb racks removed, enabled us to bring 300 children from Theresienstadt, uh, Prague uh, to England. And of course, this was the uh, Windermere rescue to the Kalgarth estate uh, in, in, um, in Windermere. I noticed that Trevor is here from, from, that, uh, from that museum. And those of you who saw the fabulous documentary, The Windermere Children, which was shown, I think, uh, around about the Holocaust Memorial Day, will know the, the story of the Windermere children, the boys, so-called, who were rescued from the camps. Uh, I think what was not clear from the documentary, or may, maybe I missed it, was that Bertha Bracey was a central figure um, in lobbying the government and organising um, that rescue uh, of those concentration camp, camp children. Soon after the arrival, uh, sorry, let me go back. Soon after the arrival of, um, of those children, kind of her work done in that respect, um, Bertha returns to Germany, where she's appointed by the Allied Control Commission to be in charge of the relief operations for the starving children, Jews, non-Jews, Germans, non-Germans. And she worked in Germany with the starving, uh, with the children, uh, until her retirement in 1953. Now, amazingly, Bertha Bracey lived on and died in 89, 1989, at the age of 97, I think she was. A friend who often visit her, visit her, visited her um, said that she was suffering from Parkinson's disease, but was still, quote, in a way formidable. I'm quoting now from this friend who visited her in her old age. She was still formidable, her intellect fantastic, she knew all about philosophy, geology, and outer space, but refugees were always her main concern." Unquote. Bracey received the OBE for her work to support refugees back in 1942, and in 2010 was posthumously recognised by the UK government as a British hero of the Holocaust. And she's also one of 21 Britons to be awarded the status of monk of Righteous Among Nations uh, by Yad Vashem. And as, I, as I think you'll see later, uh, a plaque in, in her honour uh, was, was placed at Friend's House, but I'm going to leave David to say a bit more about that. So it's a remarkable trot, well, it's a very fast trot, I should say, for a, a remarkable life of which I could only touch on the many aspects of this, of this woman. But I want to just, in the last few minutes of my talk, um, to say a little bit more about some of the other Quakers that worked with, um, with, with the Bertha in, in this period. So, for instance, um, the International Quaker Centre in Berlin, was so-called, was run by two British Quakers, uh, Corda and Gwen Catchpole. They'd been uh, in Germany, like Brent, like Bertha had, really since the 1920s. And um, uh, in the 13th, as you can see there, just after the uh, Nazis came to power, they reported that the centre was harbouring, that the centre that they ran in Berlin was actually harbouring Nazi opponents. Um, and they also defied on the 1st of April the boycott, which some of you may know, the Nazis introduced a boycott of Jewish shops. They deliberately defied that. Uh, in, in the face of huge, you can imagine, uh, harassment by the brown shirts. Not surprisingly, Corda was arrested by the Gestapo, but soon released from prison. And then really from 33 to 39, they give quiet support for Jews, including many, many visits to concentration camps to try and get them out but, and, and to help them emigrate. So there's again is a kind of untold uh, story of these unsung heroes who worked very closely with Bertha. They were the Berlin end of her work in London. 
and uh, of course had a network of German Quakers, not very many of them, but spread across Germany to, to help identify the kinder transport children that we talked about earlier. I also wanted to say a little bit about this other remarkable figure, Philip Noel Baker, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a Quaker MP, and um, a, a, an ardent and passionate supporter of uh, Jewish refugees um, and their right or their, the ability of them to come and find refuge um, in Britain. There was no one, apart from Eleanor Rathbone, who was more dedicated to getting the Jews out of Germany in the House of Commons, this is, than Philip Noel Baker. And uh, on the, that very, very important uh, speech, that, that, that very important debate on the 21st of November, when Samuel Lahore decided to allow the kinder transport children to come in, uh, Philip Noel Baker gave the speech of his life, and I do recommend you to read it. It's online in Hansard one of the most remarkable speeches surely ever heard uh, in the House of Commons. And one of the many amazing things he says was this, the refugees have surely endured enough. Dr. Goebbels said the other day that he hoped the outside world would soon forget the Jews. He hopes in vain. His campaign against them will go down in history as a lasting memory of human shame. And, um, uh, it is a part of a fantastic speech that he gives uh, in front of Samuel Hoare and the other MPs. Um, uh, and a, a remarkable man. And of course, Bertha Brace's mouthpiece, if you like, um, in the House of Commons. Um, also, this lady, uh, a cousin of Philip Noel Baker, Mary Baker Penman, who uh, lived in Prague during the 38-39 period. A flat in Prague became a, a hiding place uh, for those on the run from the Nazis. And she also harbored a young Jewish woman working as a maid, but disguised as a Czech, you know, non-Jewish woman. So a woman taking a huge amount of risk right under the noses uh, of the Nazis and reporting back to uh, Bertha at the German commi committee in London about the situation of the Jews uh, in Prague. There were Quaker responses in Britain all over the country. Bertha set up local aid committees, I would say, in every part of the country. Foster parents such as Mary Hughes in York, I'm going to talk about her in just a moment, and free or subsidised places in Quaker schools like the Friends School in Saffron Walden and the Bootham School in, in York. And um, here is Mary Hughes. She was hospitality uh, Quaker Hospitality Committee leader in York, um, uh, responsible really for tens of Jewish kinder transport children, finding homes for them in, in the Yorkshire area. And in fact, taking in two of the refugee children herself into her own home, and they stayed with her throughout the war. Um, now, I'm, very, I'm particularly keen on telling you about Mary Hughes, because in um, 2015, I met her son, David Hughes, also a Quaker, um, and managed to interview him at the age of 95. Or oh, he was, I wasn't, but he was the age of 95. Um, and um, there he is, David Hughes. And he's particularly important to me because this wonderful Quaker man who was also in the Quaker Ambulance Service during the Second World War, um, was a volunteer at the Dovercourt uh, transit camp, holiday camp in Harwich, uh, looking after the children, looking after the post office. He was a fluent German speaker, keeping their spirits up. And if we can, I'm just going to finish by playing you my interview, well, it's only two minutes, uh, with David. I'm hoping you're going to hear him. Uh, but this is the genuine voice of a Quaker. He died, sadly by the way, two years ago at the age of 101, uh, but here he is in 2015. Yeah. Hello, I'm David Hughes, and in 1939, uh, the Kinder Transport children began coming over to Harwich, and I was at Cambridge as a student, and my mother said they need volunteers at Dovercourt, so I went there 
were a random post office uh, where pretty well every child came sometime during the day. So I got to know them all and began to teach some of them English because I spoke German, which helped. <laughs> and uh, uh, there were two children, a brother and sister, uh, and uh, they'd had a bad experience of going to the wrong uh, foster mother. Uh, and so they'd come back to the camp. So I rang my mother and said, could you possibly give a home to them? And she said, yes. So <laughs> they came to us in York and uh, Harry, the boy, he was 11, he did very well at school and university, founded his own business and got the MBE from his adopted country. Uh, and uh, there was such a, I, I, I remember a lot of chatter, happy chatter, uh, all the time. They were generally cheerful, the children. It was very cold, uh, bitterly cold in January, but uh, there was a great big stove in the middle of the, of the big hall and they crowded around that and there was plenty of hot water for baths and that sort of thing but uh, generally speaking I remember this happy chatter of course thank goodness they'd got out of Germany but their parents were still there of course and uh, my mother and other people with the refugee camps in refugee committees did their best to get them out yes uh, the boy we adopted Harry Baum he said one thing he remembered me he'll never forget was the fish and chips. He'd never experienced it before, nor had any of them, I think. I think the local chippy must have helped there uh, to make a, uh, a present to all of them. And he never forgot his first fish and chips. They also went to the pictures to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, I think. Uh, and there were plenty of games uh, and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, it was sort of midwinter, so you didn't really want to walk outside much. And uh, when I came away, I inadvertently, I brought the key of my little chalet uh, with its brass fob uh, marked H13, or in German, hard right sein. And I have carried that in my pocket ever since to remind us all of that terrible time. Yep. Hello. I'm dead. So um, that was, I hope you heard that. Uh, well, um, the bit I love about David's um, memory there is he rings his mother, Mary, said, can you take two children? And she says, yes. And on the next train, I think next day he told me they were on the train to York starting their new life. You know, this was the reality of the Quaker rescue of kinder transport children on the ground. And um, I think David must be, David was probably one of the last uh, witnesses, really, as a as an adult, to the helpers who helped those children. So um, I'm going to just finish off by with a with an absolutely shameless plug. Um, I did tell the organisers I'd be waiving my thousand guinea fee, but as long as I could have this shameless plug at the end, I am a uh, I have a formed a committee for a new memorial to the kinder transport where we can tell all of these stories it's the, the forgotten stories particularly um, and uh, it's going to be on the quayside in Harwich near where the children actually arrived most of them anyway and um, if you want to find out a bit more about this uh, if you're willing to maybe donate something to the statue uh, you can see the, the address there so I hope you found that interesting useful on it's a bit of a canter through a gigantic subject but hopefully that's whetted your appetite to learn more and also I think to to um, doff our hats our caps whatever and a small bow to the fantastic work that the Quakers did uh, for for those refugees in that period and continue to do as David now will, will talk about so there we are that's that's my that's my that's my part of the talk done Lovely. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a, a wonderful canter, most illuminating, very moving and indeed inspirational. It's now my great pleasure to introduce David Dobson. Uh, I did ask him to send me a little bit of text about him and he's kept it very informal, so I will duly <laughs> transmit what he's, he's written. He tells me that he was brought up in North London in Muswell Hill, which had a 
fairly substantial Jewish community, still does, I, I guess, and therefore mixed very happily with Jewish children in both primary and indeed later at grammar school. My small family of parents, and I'm quoting here, grandmother and aunt were very pro-Jewish. There was a family tradition that a young Jewish girl married into the family way back in 1838 <laughs> in rural Oxfordshire, but a Jewish academic has recently discounted this as being most implausible. <laughs> Since becoming a Quaker in uh, actually quite recently in, in 2015, he's delved more deeply into the connection between the Quakers and the Jews in the 1930s and with the tran kinder transport and the Holocaust, of course, tightly bound up with that. And he ends by saying, at a very personal level, I believe I have a responsibility to keep these memories alive. So over to you, David. I know you want to show some images, so you just tell me, would you like me to start with the images? already or, or not just? I am ready. Thank you very much. Um, Go ahead. I think it's fairly unlikely that many of you will have been into a me uh, Quaker meeting room. Um, in a sense, why should you? Uh, I'm just going to show you two. This is in Cambridge, the main Quaker uh, group in Jesus Lane, and you can see the setup it is a normal setup to have a little table, uh, flowers, sometimes a few books and people sitting there. And near it, there is a library. Libraries are very important to Quakers. They read quite a lot. Uh, and as an interesting uh, bit about Jesus Lane, uh, which, uh, let me just check how long it's been there. Um, that's been there since the 1650s from the very beginning of Quakers and um, what you're looking at is actually a building of 1777. But now I'd like Monica to switch to the Birmingham picture and uh, you won't see this very often, uh, but uh, this is, I could say what Quakers do, which is a bit of a funny thing, but I think you understand. Quakers basically sit in silence for part of their meeting. Um, and they um, will occasionally stand and say something and sit. And so that is a very typical Quaker meeting in progress. It is not in a church uh, or a cathedral or with stained glass and lots of icons. Not that we are critical of those, but it's just not for us. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm just going to um, do a little bit of talking, if I may. Um, I just want to actually leave that there because that, that's a focus for us. Um, there are about 17,000 Quakers in Britain, plus about 9,000 regular attenders. Um, they're people who come regularly but haven't formally decided to actually become a Quaker. And across the world, and this is very difficult to assess because we are almost everywhere, oddly enough, there's between 250,000 and 300,000 across the world. I'm now not going to follow that with the Birmingham Meeting House. If, oh, yeah, I, I'm so sorry. That's right. Um, I'm going to quote a modern day, very well read Quaker thinker, which focuses on the Holocaust. His name is Tom Shakespeare. There's a lovely name. Um, he itemizes key Quaker beliefs and then focuses on whether these are enough in times of emergency, such as the Holocaust. And Tom writes this, as Quakers, we still rely on the virtues of trust, solidarity, toleration. We have written testimonies to peace, truth, equality, simplicity. But does a de an emergency demand more of us? And he, visit, and he mentions when he visited Israel in 2019, he went to the Holocaust Museum. He talks about the indescribable suffering that he had presented there. And he was looking for hope. 
and the hope was from the stories of the righteous among nations, ordinary people that gave their lives for Jews, some who survived, and they number 27,000 people. That stopped him crying for most of the time, and he came out with that glimmer of hope. But this is to Tom's big lesson for Quakers today. We cannot be passive. Better days do not drop into our laps. They have to be actively worked for. This means taking responsibility in being grown up rather than resorting to the politics of victimhood and complaint Depending where we live and when we happen to live, sometimes it means being very brave indeed. So I'm going to talk a little about the response of German Quakers to the rise of the Nazis, including sometimes where a husband or wife happened to be British. This is taken from a talk by Brenda Bailey, whose mother, Mary, was married to Leonard Friedrich, who lived in Nuremberg, and both were Quakers. I've tried to track that, Brenda would be about 94, I've tried to track down whether she's still with us, but I haven't been able to. But these are Brenda's words. In January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor and the Jewish boycott took place on April the 1st. My mother, Mary, decided this was the day for both of us, I was just six years old, to walk through town to visit our Jewish friends and the small Jewish shopkeepers en route. She totally ignored the warning signs, telling guards she needed to speak to the shopkeeper and walk through any doors that were open to talk and comfort the frightened people inside. No doubt Mary's English accent helped, but intriguingly, camera crews were on the streets to record the events of the day. And one of her friends, a Quaker, went to the cinema that evening and was horrified to see Mary and myself talking to a guard and pushing past him into a Jewish shop. Friends in the meeting house were slightly perturbed by this and wondered if this was a bit of a risk. Uh, I can tell you briefly what she said back, but it's almost rude. In Berlin, two famous married Quakers that Mike has mentioned, Corder and Gren Catchpool, with the British Quaker representatives in Berlin. They paid similar visits to Jewish shops during the boycott, but two days later, their house was searched and their family were put under house arrest. Corder was taken to the Gestapo HQ and questioned for 36 hours, and then he was released. During the, the time up to the war, he not only worked in Germany, but Czechoslovakia and Lithuania amongst children. They left in 1939, but like quite a few Quakers, in 1946 returned to Germany to try and help where he could. There is a famous key meeting of Quakers after that Nazi boycott of Jewish shops. Bertha Bracey joined the Frankfurt Quakers Executive Committee meeting on the 8th of 9th. And this is what she said. I never felt the strength and depth of German friends, friends is another word for Quakers, so strongly, though there were differences of opinion. However, Throughout the weekend, there was a dignity, restraint and quietness, which made me realize afresh that every ordeal and every moment of critical decision is almost also a moment of witness to the spirit of true religion. 
No one can foresee what may happen in the next few months. But Quakerism, in its strength and simplicity, lives in Germany today and will live come what may. Later, they issued an agreed statement. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to quote this bit. What you do now must depend on your own personal conscience. But there can be no gap between our religious conviction and our actions. Others need us and need to have faith in us. So beside the big well-known dramatic things, what did German Quakers undertake? And there weren't many of them. There was perhaps about 200. These are the sorts of things they did. They continued to visit Jewish friends or saw them in Quaker centers. As Micah said, they visited concentration camps where Jewish men or women were imprisoned. They took them supplies and lobbied senior staff to allow some reduction in the harsh conditions. And as Micah said, sometimes they were able to arrange, arrange exit visas and emigration. Rather typically, Quakers tore down Nazi anti-Jewish posters at night when no one was looking. In some cases, though, the really brave took them to the local mayor and questioned the validity of such material. Most of these are, are very tough women. I can just imagine the mayor wondering what had hit them. If challenged by Nazis with a Nazi salute, their reply would be, who's got which numbed the Nazi and didn't know what to do. Some Quakers were actually sent to concentration camps, some for a very long time. They hid Jewish friends in their own homes and others, sometimes just the children. And of course, when it came to the kinder transport, they were very, very actively involved. But there came a key moment when it became very difficult for British Quakers to work in Germany and Austria and Poland. On August the 24th, 1939, when Stalin and Hitler announced their non-aggression pact and Britain announced a mutual assistance treaty with Poland and order prescription they very reluctantly left, unless they were married to a German or Austrian, in which case they virtually all stayed. But now in a sense, responsibility for helping Jews was handed over to German or American Quakers or some other people. Mike has briefly mentioned, um, just coming to this bit, the mass feeding that was undertaken after the First World War. And this is relevant. It's not only relevant for what it did to the children in Germany and Austria, but it did leave this memory. And I was amazed to discover from a colleague of mine, who's not Quaker, who was there when this subject came up, this is today, uh, Germans remember the amazing, amazing mass feeding, Quaker Speisel, as it's called, though my German is weak. When a American friend's ambulance arrived in, in Germany, they were horrified to find the terrible hunger and particularly the children. The British and French Navy had blockaded Germany to try and force the German leaders to accept the Versailles document. So what then happened was that the, the, they sent their reports back to, to America and the American Quaker unit, sorry, alerted the HQ in America. And this information 
were sent to the head of the American Food Organization, a Quaker whose name you might know, Herbert Hoover. Before he became president and built his famous dam, he asked an American Quaker called Rufus Jones to go to Germany and Austria to assess the situation. And what he saw was calamitous. If Mona can just pop on the screen, that's Rufus Jones. Uh, this is a very extraordinary man. He combined incredible organizational skills with a very deep spirituality. He wrote a lot on both. Um, he was an extraordinary man. And as a result of that, Herbert Hoover uh, issued a vast amount of money to buy food for Germany and Austria. And the, st the statistics of this exercise are really quite extraordinary. Not forgetting that this was entirely organized by volunteers. But let me just give you some numbers. There were 1,000 Quakers over Germany and Austria. There were 40,000 German and Austrian volunteers. There were 2,700 kitchens, 8,500 feeding centers, and they fed a million meals a day. And a total of 5 million children were helped. But then British Quakers spotted, excuse me, a gap. They spotted that the, children, the, the young people who were at college or university, who were also in a terrible strait, were not being fed. And so they, they wanted to do this, but a bit of hierarchy, bureaucracy came in here. And so very quickly, the British Quakers bought the food off the Americans and they started to feed the children. And they were feeding 15,000 students a day from every college and university in Germany and started with 12,000 children in Cologne. For some reason, Cologne had been missed, rising to 30,000 children a day. And as I've said, this great humanitarian effort remained deep in German and Austrian memory. And I will return to it briefly after my mention of Kristallnacht. I don't have to mention Kristallnacht to a German audience. It acted, however, as the catalyst, catalyst for some Jewish parents to queue outside Quaker centers in Berlin, Frankfurt, Vienna, and big cities, desperate for help and to get their children onto the kinder transport. Now, for me, the, even though Quakers were very organized and had foreseen this, what amazes me is that only three weeks after Christmas, the first group of kinder transport children left Berlin railway station, traveled to the Netherlands port and onward to Harwich in December, 1938. And this is a very, very rare photograph. I discovered it almost accidentally. It's fairly obvious. They are inside the train, they're in Berlin station and they're peering out. Whether they can see their parents or not, I cannot say because sometimes the German, the Nazis kept them away. But I think that's a very graphic and powerful scene before the, the train trundled off towards Austria and then to the Netherlands. Now, this mass feeding after the First World War, some Quakers, a few Jews very interested, some academics, except that because the mass feeding covered everyone, it obviously included the children who grew up and became Nazis. 
there's a PhD thesis by Rose Holmes from Sussex University, which I know Mike knows. And Rose writes, the International Center in Vienna had been established in 1919 as a famine relief center and considerable goodwill had been built up among the local Austrian population. Bertha Bracy attributed much of the influence of the Vienna Center to the legacy of the feeding projects. And there is one small paragraph from Bertha herself, uh, which I find incredible. She writes this, we are a very small religious society, although even in that time, I remember getting a letter from Heydrich and even some of the other leading Nazis who sometimes do things because they remembered the Quaker feeding between the wars when they were children receiving this. In part, I find this extraordinary, particularly Reinhard Heydrich, who she's referring to. I'm sure many of you know that he was the chief of Gestapo. He later chaired the infamous Wannsee Conference in 1942, which planned the final solution. And before that, he organized a crystal net. But he would have been between 15 and 18 when British Quakers fed German students. Then I discovered a second source from Bertha Bracy in a book by Lynn, Lynn Smith, Heroes of the Holocaust, which again I know Mike knows. And Lynn says, they remembered the Quaker feeding. At one point, Bertha received a letter from Ryan Heydrich regarding an inquiry she had made about men, two men who had disappeared. One of her letters, about a German social worker was even possibly sent to Adolf Hitler. Bertha recalls, we don't know whether he got the letter, but the social worker was released and became one of our most valuable workers. Yes, we had small concessions, not only from Heydrich, but from Goering and Hitler's office. In fact, at one time, I thought this might look very suspicious and I went to the British Foreign Office to explain why I had made contact. The second person to mention the Quaker spies on impact, the possible impact on Nazis is again Rufus Jones, who you remember was crucial in the post -world, First World War feeding program. In 1938, he and two other Americans flew to Berlin Having spoken to large numbers of Jewish organizations, Quaker organizations, they composed a letter, had it translated in German, and eventually, to their surprise, met two very senior Gestapo officers to try and negotiate a Quaker deal to help some Jews after Kristallnacht. Crucially, though, they knew that Reinhard Heydrich, head of the Gestapo, was in the very next office to the two men where they sat. And it was Heydrich who would make the final decision. The letter they presented begins with a Quaker history of support with feeding and other forms of help. The two senior Gestapo officers went and spent some time with their boss. They returned and their request was accepted. And for a short time, I'm not sure about numbers, but some Jewish families were able to emigrate. And of course there was the kinder transport. There's an article written by Rufus Jones in 1947. He adds that he believes, and these are his words, uncomplicated sincerity of their meeting softened the two senior Nazis because their initial harshness mellowed. Now I have to say to you, I'm not sure about this, but that's what he wrote and he was he was he wasn't a stupid man at all.
but it is interesting. But how many, how many this saved, I don't know. I'm now going to mention, because in a sense, refugees is also part of this. Um, the main Quaker events that you will not know about, or almost certainly not know about, starting with the Irish potato famine, which you know about, 1843 and 47, there was a mass Quaker response to that. And not only did they provide food and vegetables to grow, but they even started little businesses all over Ireland. Some of them succeeded. In the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 to 73, they also provided help to the victims of violence. Even, in some ways, this is even more remarkable, the Russian famine in the 1920s. Stalin actually let them in. And the Spanish Civil War, including refugees in France in 1936 and 39. And post-war, as has been mentioned, quite a few British Quakers went back and worked in the British and American sectors. And as you have heard, Bertha Bracey was extremely fast in collecting about 200, 200 children from a concentration camp and flying them to Windermere. And again, here's something you won't know. The troubles in Northern Ireland, 1966 to 1998, which was a war. Quakers were the only group, you were either Protestant or you were Catholic, and in a sense we are neither. We were the only group that families could go to and would sometimes be hidden and looked after. And although word got out to both sides, they didn't attack, they didn't lead up to this, and then and this is very little known, Quakers began to meet paramilitaries on both sides. This is very hidden. And in fact, a lot of it is still very confidential. But I know from the then Labour, da, 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 the famous woman who was the Minister for Northern Ireland, um, I, know from, I know from her that this had a big impact. We have Quakers, a parliamentary liaison officer, a man called Michael Bartlett, and these are his views on refugees now. Refugees are the human face of international injustice. They are the place in this country where we can see the real impact of inequality and armed conflict the inability of failed states to provide a secure home for their citizens and abusive governments. The impact of climate change adds a further dimension in the increasing pressure on land and resources and increases the, increases the number of refugees. In Cambridge now, probably the main thing that charities do is to help refugees coming into Cambridge. There's a group called the Cambridge Refugee Resettlement Group, which does that. And we're very practical. It, you have to be practical here. They go out and find private landlords who will accept council rents. They find furniture and household equipment and bicycles. They help families settle in by decorating homes and tidying gardens. They chaperone patients to medical appointments. They offer one-to-one -one help with homework for refugee children. They run English lessons, including childcare to benefit young men, mothers. They organize programs of outings and activities and school holidays. And they find people who can speak Arabic to translate and offer learning. They get families once 
once, sorry, once a month together for a social event, and if necessary, they offer counselling and advice. I'm now drawing to the end of my talk, where I've concentrated on Quakers, because that's what I am. Um, I was, I'm trying to think of the word here. I was spurred on to try and do a piece of artwork for this talk, uh, and this is it, and it's very self-evident. The Q is a capital Q for Quakers, and the Star of David is in there, and Kinder Transport. I do that because I've come to the conclusion, and I've read a lot of this, that uh, in the 1930s, and 1940s in Nazi Europe and Britain, um, I believe there was probably a unique relationship between Quakers and the Kinder, sorry, Quakers and Jews. That's my own feeling. I don't think any group ever worked as tightly as they did. I am not discounting other church groups, but I just feel Quakers had it. And now, with that still on the screen, I'm going to close with this poem. It's by a, um, a kinder transport survivor, Lottie Kramer from Vienna, who survived and was at some point based at the German Jewish Studies Department of Sussex University. And it's called Exodus. For all mothers in anguish, pushing out their babies in a small basket, to let the river cradle them and kind hands find and nurture them, providing safety in a hostile world, our constant gratitude. As in the last century, crowded trains taking us away from home became our baby basket rattling to foreign parts, our exodus from death. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, David. That was intensely moving. It really, really was. I wonder if before I stop screen sharing, I could just um, carry on with one or two more images. And indeed the poem, this is actually a very kind of, mm, natural connection. Um, this is two views of a sculpture that some of you just perhaps may have encountered, although I rather doubt it. It's on the sort of mezzanine level on the ma main staircase of Friends Meeting House in Euston Road, which has been mentioned more than once. And it's by a Holocaust survivor sculptor called Naomi Blake. Family group, obviously so dedicated to of course Bertha Bracy, which is why I put it in here. And this is the plaque that is on the pedestal there and perhaps I should indeed end there. Um, it seems so absolutely fitting that you know, this brings everything together, does it, does it not? So I'm going to stop sharing now and um, we have various questions. Uh, I'm aware that it's quite late, but I think this is too precious an opportunity not to continue the discussion. So do keep them uh, coming. Um, I have, let me actually, it's difficult to just, let me just cast a quick look at the, the chat. Um, I have a very obvious question, actually for David and for Mike, perhaps, um, obvious, but actually really important. Why is it that so little credit has been given to the Quakers? What's, you know, what's the backstory, as it were? What, how, how do you explain that? Well, I've read about three academic PhD theses on what you've mentioned. It's changing, am I right? There's now, but this is so late in the day, isn't it? Yes, I think um, um, we don't clap our hands in the air. We don't go around <laughs> saying, gosh, look what we've done, aren't we good? Um, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we're different from other people. It just means there's something ingrained in us that feels particularly in emergencies like this, that something's got to happen. 
And after the war, um, when, when you are the nation that wins, if I could put it that way, you tend to talk about the military uh, victory and you, you tend to insult the people that you were, uh, you defeated, which is actually not the Quaker way. So we didn't write to lots of newspapers and we didn't get on television screens and we very rarely do. Um, but as an individual Quaker, looking back over those remarkable men and women, um, I'm very proud of them. So you should be. I mean, what strikes me, and I'm sure Mike and indeed everybody listening will agree, that it seems that it all seems so natural to them to do good, that actually it would have been perverse and completely inconceivable for them to do otherwise. And I think that's a mark of true, true goodness, is it not? I mean, Mike, do you want, do you want to ch chip in here? You're, you're, you're on mute. Ah, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I beg your pardon. Yes, not normally I'm on mute. Um, I, I totally agree with David. I think it's about stealth effacement uh, on, on the Quaker part. That's the, that's the first thing and most important thing. Um, and as David rightly says, as soon as, you know, the, when the war was over, it was a new kind of world of Cold War, of, um, you know, victor and, vic you know, and defeated and so on. And, and so that narrative really never got properly aired. I think also... There is a general, um, you know, this is what my book's about, really. There's a general sense of forgetting, I think, about um, the rescuers, about the people who, who did that work, because they did it, you know, with it quietly, conscientiously, bravely, but not out there and telling the world and shouting at the world. So I think there is a, that Quakers are part of a continuum of forgetting, if you like. Okay, there are at least two questions here to do with um, Jews becoming Quakers, turning to Quaker Quakerism. Is that forgive me? That's not the right the right term. Sort of perhaps in later life as a result of the help that they had received. I wonder, David, whether you know anything about this. And in, uh, yes, uh, and in fact, as a corollary of that, somebody's even asking whether, if that was indeed sometimes the case, whether maybe this is a question back to you, Mike, whether there was some resentment felt on the part of the Jewish community. And I just, you know, interesting question, I think. There was a general resentment, or not resentment, amongst some elements of the Jewish community that felt that children being placed in Christian families uh, was a danger to the Jewish soul. I mean, people like Rabbi Schoenfeld and uh, the chief rabbi and others uh, certainly felt that very strongly. It was an argument that was more uh, um, towards the kind of missionary evangelical uh, churches than the Quakers. I can't think of any particular instance of Quakers being attacked, you know, for missionary work. And that's what, interesting what David says. Mm -hmm. I don't think in Ella, I don't think missionary it, it was part of their mm -hmm. part of their DNA. Would I be right there, David? Uh, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, um, there are, <laughs> there is a very, very small group of, of uh, British Jews who either are also Quakers or, or occasionally go to them. I actually know one couple. Um, and, and they're not going to go around banging the drum. Um, and um, for the last Passover, I, I had the joy, although it was a bit strange, I, I shared their Passover meal. Uh, in a Zoom meeting with about 20 of them, um, and uh, not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, I had none of their food, but I did have a glass of red wine at certain times, and I enjoyed it. But um, yes, we don't, it's not true to say that once upon a time we didn't attempt to um, convert. That would be completely wrong. But um, certainly, I've never, ever read any account of, of, of um, Jewish children being looked after by a Quaker family where that happened. I think there might have been an element of respect, which is completely different, but the idea that deal what the deal was, we'll look after you and then you'll join our church, would be 
Well, I, I can't think of a worse thing we could ever, ever do, and we didn't. I don't think that was the implication, David. It was more a question of being so impressed, perhaps, by what the Quakers had done that they were there, you know, thereby prompted to become Quakers. I think that was probably more the thrust of, of, of the question. Um, there's a question here specifically about um, Cambridge during the war from um, Claire. Sorry, I can't see the surname of hand. My parents were members of the Jesus Lane meeting and involved in refugee work. My mother was a refugee and my father went on to work in the Quaker house in, uh, in Vienna and also in London. Uh, does anyone know about the wartime work in Cambridge during the war? Uh, no. <laughs> well, um, I, I, can say, I can say a little bit about it yeah. because um, there, there was a lady from a very um, well-known Quaker family called Mary, um, Hilda Sturge. The Sturges were very much a Birmingham Quaker family and she was a stalwart of the Friends House during the war. And she was secretary of the Cambridge Refugee Committee throughout the entire period. Uh, and in fact, the very first meetings of the Cambridge Refugee Committee set up to get the children, particularly uh, out of Germany in 38, was at Hilda Sturge's home. That was the headquarters of the Cambridge Refugee Committee. And they also had early meetings at the Friends House. So there was definitely a strong Quaker connection through Hilda Sturge um, but um, uh, in Cambridge, yes, absolutely. Um, another uh, quite a practical question. Um, I understand that most of the records from Bloomsbury House were destroyed after the war. Is this correct? Or is there some way of accessing at least some of the material? Uh, shall I answer that one? Um, it's true that most of the records uh, probably were, I mean, deliberately destroyed. That was a policy that um, it's kind of an early GDPR sort of sensitivity uh, after the war. But um, there are records that do that are extant through the World Jewish Relief, um, where a lot of the registration records uh, and some of the Bloomsbury House uh, records of the Jewish Refugee Committee do exist and have been digitized. Yeah. And I think if I'm not right, yes, I think there were 35,000 case files held um, at the London Metropolitan Archive, but also digitized at the World Jewish Relief. If you've got relatives who came over as refugees, it's worth asking WJR if they have access, if they have any records, and they will tell you if they have. And David, do you happen to know what the state of play is in the archives at Friends House? Because I did make contact with somebody there at the beginning of my Insiders Outsiders project, and they had hoped to, in fact, um, release, as it were, volunteers to look through the archives for the relevant years. And I'm, sadly, I think it didn't happen, but I just wonder how much, and maybe, Mike, again, have you delved into this? I mean, there's much to be discovered, I, I suspect. I don't know, what, does David know? I mean, the, um, from what I, what I know, I mean, I've spent many a happy hour in the Friends House Library, as I'm sure some of the other people I know here have. There is, uh, there are, there are some records, but the majority of the records were destroyed, sadly. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a great big gap uh, in their kinder transport records, which is really sad. A question about the the nature of the kinder transport. Um, how many, from Mark Frankel, how many kinder transport children were Jews, and how many were non-Aryan Christians? Presumably, a rather small number, but. Give us an idea. Yeah, I, I would say it, I don't think anyone's ever been able to do a full count because mm -hmm. the records of older ten thousand or so were not were not kept. But uh, given the record cards that I've seen um, and other uh, AJR, for instance, did um, surveys and so on in the early two thousands, I would say probably in between ten and twenty percent of the kinder transport children were so called non Aryan. Uh, Jews, in other words, they were from Jewish backgrounds, but from Christianized, baptized, possibly uh, families. And that's very much presumably where George Bell and the work that he did becomes yes. relevant, and he yes, must have given his uh, job as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And also the Quakers took on uh, the responsibility, particularly in Vienna, actually, uh, with um, uh, uh, Edith Pye and Hilda Clark. She of the shoe company, by the way, Clark's, uh, 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 spent time in Vienna, uh, particularly on the non-Aryan children and getting them out of Vienna 
before the before war broke out. There is actually a question specifically about Vienna. I wonder if you might say a little bit more about the specific situation there. What was the question? About, about Vienna, Quaker efforts in Austria and specifically Vienna. Um, I, the, all I know, I'm afraid, is is the um, is the, um, the I know that the Quakers work very closely with the um, IK, IKG, which was the Jewish Cultural Institute of, organization um, in Vienna, and they work very closely on uh, arranging the Kinder transports under the eye, of course, of Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, who was the so-called Jewish emigration officer in Vienna. Um, but certainly Hilda Clark was a key figure. Um, and the, the exciting news about Vienna is that a lot of the records have survived, but have not really been looked at. And it's very frustrating for we research oh. to get there. Uh, so as soon as the world is open, I'll be on that um, train to Vienna. I think probably now that it's half past nine, it is time to start winding up. And I have one opposite last comment um, from um, somebody called David, I do believe it is. Just thanking you both, well, for speaking, or particularly David, for speaking about present concerns about refugees needing support now at a time when the UK government's policies are so hostile. I had thought it too political to raise myself, but thank you for all your community has done and still doing in such times of need. Here, here. Many, many thanks, David, and thanks to you, Mike. Very many thanks indeed to all of you for being here. And if I